Hello and welcome to the Friday Football Show. I'm Alan Saunders. Welcome to the Beaver County Auto Studios. It's great to be back here after uh, I took an off week last week. And, uh, well, I, I wouldn't take it totally off, but didn't come into the studio. It's great to be back in our wonderful facility here at Pittsburgh Sports Live. And uh, we're going to talk football, as always, this Friday. And we've got a lot going on, uh, so I'm just going to dive right into it. And, of course, we don't have anything to talk about what I got right and what I got wrong last week because, well, there wasn't really much football to talk about with the Steelers and the Pitt Panthers, both on a bye week. Talked a little bit about Whippeo football. Uh, talked a little bit about Pitt athletics in general. Uh, and I think had a pretty good show, um, but not a lot of predictions to uh, look back upon. So we'll just move straight into looking ahead to this week. And I want to start with the Pittsburgh Steelers because what a bye week it turned out to be. Um, the Steelers started the weekend in third place in the AFC North. The Cleveland Browns lost, the Cincinnati Bengals lost, the Baltimore Ravens lost, and the Steelers came out of their bye week in first place at 3-2-1. and one. Um it's really hard to imagine that week going any better than it did for the Steelers. And they've sort of somehow carried the momentum from that win over Cincinnati two weeks ago through their off week into this week's game against Cleveland. And the Browns aren't in a particularly good spot right now. Um, they had a, a weird overtime loss to Tampa Bay last week, a game they probably shouldn't have even been in. Um, but Baker Mayfield made some nice plays down the stretch to get them close and then a missed field goal at the end of regulation put them into overtime and they end up losing on a long field goal. Um, but it's a weird spot for the Steelers because now all of a sudden this game's really important. Um, the Steelers, of course, tied the Browns the first time they played them this year. And the bye week losses by the other three teams in the division have set things up so that the Steelers get a win this week. They're really kind of in the driver's seat um, in the AFC North. And uh, I'm going to here. I'll bring up the standings real quick, and uh, let me get that out of there for you. Steelers in the first place at three, two, and one. Baltimore and Cincinnati just behind. The thing I want to really draw attention to are those point differentials. If you've ever paid any attention to something uh, called a Pythagorean record, basically it's uh, used more in sports like baseball and hockey where they play a lot of games. But it's the record a team ought to have on average if it scored as many points and allowed as many points as it had to this point in the season. You can see the Ravens should be the best team of the three. The Bengals should be the worst after seven games uh, for each of those three teams. And so the fact that the Steelers are in first place is kind of an upset to begin with, but here's how, here's how it, it kind of plays out in their favor is that the Ravens have to go to Carolina. They've got a tough game this week. Um, the Steelers could pick up a game and a half on the Ravens with a Ravens loss and a Brown and a Steelers win, and that's that's huge at this point in the season. Um, it could really set things up for the Steelers to be the team that's being chased in the AFC North the whole rest of the way. And um, yeah, it, it, it made this a huge week because if the Steelers lose this game, then that not only sort of brings the Browns back into the con conversation at the top of the division, it turns that that tie that the Steelers right now have as an advantage into a disadvantage. Um, it, it certainly doesn't help their AFC record or their division record at all either. So really, this, this has become a very important game. And if the Steelers win it, they have definitely set themselves up to be in the driver's seat in the division the rest of the way. Um, you know, not, not an easy game for the Bengals this week either. They've got Tampa coming in, so it's to be kind of like a rainy, miserable, um, show, you know, a game that, that any of those three games seem losable for all those three teams again this week. Um, certainly the Steelers are, I believe, an eight-point favorite, but I don't know how you can feel – uh, like it's a game they're definitely going to win after the tying the Browns in Cleveland. I certainly think the Steelers should win this game. And I think at this point, this is a, a sort of season-defining game. If they can win this game to go to 4-2-1, and one, separate themselves from some of the rest of the division, even though the first couple games of this season did not go the way the Steelers and Steelers fans thought they would, I think you could point to... Okay, by this point, yeah, four two and one, or you know, f maybe five and two, or s something like that, is about where you'd think the Steelers would be. A game and a half up in the division is about where you'd think the Steelers would be, and they've set themselves up for 
what appears to be a, a playoff run. It certainly looks like um, they're one of the best six teams in the AFC. That's the football. Now I want to talk about the not football because – in 2018, with the Steelers, football is only about 30% of the conversation, it seems. The rest of the conversation is about drama, and the Steelers have no, pl- no shortage of that. But the part of the drama that's been a bit weird to me is this outrage over the Steelers not trading for Arizona Cardinals cornerback Patrick Peterson. Peterson's a great player, certainly would be useful to a team that needs help at cornerback. Um, but it's just weird to me. Um, a lot of what I feel like is coming from the fan base doesn't like line up with with what I think in my head. I'm going to talk through that right now. So I guess it, you kind of have to look at it a couple different ways. The first way is a lot of people are saying, well, this isn't the Steelers' MO. It's not how the Steelers do business. They just aren't going to go trade what is probably going to be a, a high-round pick, a first-round pick for a player in season. And that's true. It's also not anybody else's MO because if you go back beyond maybe five or six years, NFL trades were extraordinarily rare. Nobody did them. So it's nobody's MO. I don't think that should disqualify the Steelers from taking a look at this. And I strongly feel that they they probably did their due diligence. They probably have a pretty good idea what it would have taken or what it would take to trade for Pat Peterson or a number of other players around the league. That's what general managers do, right? They find out what would it take to get this guy? What would it take to get that guy? What do I have to offer? That's part of their daily job. They don't need to tell Adam Schefter or Ed Bouchette or me or you about what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. So I think the Steelers, I'm sure, investigated the idea of trading for Patrick Peterson. I don't know if it ever got any farther beyond that. But don't dismiss the idea out of hand just because it's not something they've done in the past. That's the first thing. And I'm sure they didn't. The second thing is, is it a good idea to trade for Patrick Peterson or really anybody this season? And I think that's where it gets a little bit hazier. Can you look at the Steelers and say they're a Super Bowl contender with one more player? I don't even think they're the best team in the AFC. I mean, that if you look at the, the Super Bowl odds right now, they're 18 to 1, which is the seventh best odds in the NFL and the third best odds in the AFC behind the Chiefs, who they've already lost to, and the Patriots. I mean, I just got done saying, yes, the Steelers could put themselves in the driver's seat in the AFC North, but they're still probably looking at a wild card game, even mess case scenario. I just don't think this is a team that is one player away. And then you look at the cost benefit of trading a first round draft pick. If you trade a first round draft pick for a player, yeah, you get to fill that cap space that you're not using. They've got 10 million in cap space from Le'Veon Bell that they're not using this year. Um, They can try to fill it. But then... In 2019, yeah, you have Pat Peterson, but you don't have a first-round draft pick. Um, and so what if you wait until the offseason? Well, if you wait until the offseason to make a move, yeah, you've, you've missed out on an opportunity to add to this team. But then you have all of the $10.3 million from Bell. You have another $3.1 million in dead money from Mike Mitchell that's coming off the books. And you can spend that money without having to trade something to get the asset you're paying, right? You don't, you can just sign a $10 million corner, and then you have another $3 million to play around with, and you still have all the other players that the Steelers have right now. Because if you look at their free agents, Ramon Foster is the only guy who's currently a full-time starter that's on this list. Jesse James, Cody Sensabaugh, some guys that are kind of useful pieces, Darius hayward Bay, Anthony Ciccolo, LJ Ford. Those guys are replaceable or signable. There's nobody here that they're losing that is a big deal. So assuming Ben Roethlisberger is going to play in 2019, and every indication that he's given is that he probably will, there's no reason for the Steelers to make that kind of trade right now. They could have their corner and their first-round draft pick a year from now, both making an impact on the 2019 team. And the only way to acquire a player without trading that draft pick is to give away a player that's currently on the team. And I don't see many players of value that the Steelers have if they're not currently using. Maybe somebody really likes Mason Rudolph. I don't know. I don't see it. But it's not like the Cardinals have a quarterback. So maybe, maybe that could be something that they should look into. But other than that, they don't have pieces that they can afford to lose that aren't going to hurt the team while they're adding to it. They don't have any positions where they're deep enough to say, we don't need... James Washington, or we don't need, you know, Anthony Ciccolo. They're not deep enough to to have extra players. So the only way they're getting somebody is to trade those high draft picks, which means they're going to hurt 2019 to help 2018. And with 
$13.4 million in cap space that's not on the field this year, 18 doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like the year that you make that move. Now, maybe you do it next year. Maybe you sign your, your $10 million corner. You sign a linebacker. You dra- or you draft a linebacker in the first round. And then maybe you trade the 2020 first round pick to win in 19 when all the cards are, are out there. If you're a poker player, this is not the time to push the, all the chips in. This is where you try to stay in for cheap and see if you can turn this kind of mediocre start into something that looks a little bit better. But that's not going to change. Those odds aren't going to change between now and the trade deadline. There are chances of winning the division, avoiding a wild card game, coming out of the AFC. And really, even if their odds improve on all that, I think the Rams are the best team in the NFL and have the best chance of winning the Super Bowl, pretty much even if the Steelers added two players. But this isn't it. This is not the year to go and make that move. It just isn't. They're not that close to being a Super Bowl contender. They're a team that has a chance. Yes, that improved their chance slightly with a player like Peterson, but they would also be decreasing. There, there's a trade-off, right? You improve your chance in 18 to lessen your chance in 19. But they, they don't have to do that. They can just keep things the way they are in 18 and then play with a full complement in 19 and really be aggressive then. Um, that seems to be the move that I would make. I don't understand, you know, maybe Arizona doesn't even really want to trade him. Maybe he doesn't want to be traded. He said so on social media. Uh, Anger over this issue doesn't make any sense to me. Um, But then again, anger over a lot of issues doesn't make sense to me. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Pitt is in an interesting position because they've played pretty badly a lot of this season. But they also are in a pretty good position. They're 2-1 and in the ACC Coastal Division. And if they beat Duke this week, they'll be right there at the top of the division. They'll be in a sort of the very worst a half game back of first place if they win this week. And I think it's a winnable game. Duke isn't a particularly challenging matchup for Pitt. I think it's a a winnable game and a game that they should win. Um, And so there's there's this piece of the fan base. And I guess maybe you have to have lived through 40 years of frustration of of being a pit fan to understand it but there's a piece of the fan base that every single story we post on facebook here we'll get the oh we don't have a facebook graphic we need one of those we got a twitter graphic we'll do that one every single story we post on social media it's they don't have a chance what are you thinking fire narduzzi move to the mac cancel the football team it's all over. Sky not only fell, is falling, it fell. It's laying on us. We're dead. We're trapped. We're in a gutter outside Gene's place. I, I can't, I can't understand it because it's just, it's ignoring the nature of college football. Teams are inconsistent. They get better. They get worse. The, the first five or six results, and really when you're looking at Pitt, it's, it's mostly those first four results don't define because who who's I mean nobody's super upset about what happened two weeks ago at Notre Dame right I mean they took a, the number five team in the country to the final possession of the game that's a good game for anybody not just for Pitt so you can't just look at what happened and say that's what's gonna happen that, that's not how college football works I and mean, if we look at Temple lost to Villanova And then they just beat Cincinnati, who was on the verge of being ranked. East Carolina, who lost to Temple, also lost to North Carolina A&T, but beat North Carolina, the regular old one, who beat Pitt. And then Pitt went and almost beat Notre Dame. It doesn't make any sense. It's not going to make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. They're kids. They're not consistent. They're not professionals. They don't handle the conditions well. They don't handle playing on the road well. There's a million things that can cause a team to lose a football game. And when you look at the way Pitt lost those games, it's not like they lined up, played their best football, and got creamed. They played like crap. They played bad games against Penn State and against Central Florida. They, they, they made dumb mistakes. They had poor special teams. They turned the ball over. They had too many penalties. They did the things that you can't do to win football games. But there's no reason to think that they can't stop doing those things. They played a great game against Syracuse. They played a great game against Notre Dame. They're in a pretty good spot. And the, if they win this Duke game... They're in a great spot going forward. They've got to win this week, though. You look at the rest of the schedule, they'll have three of the last four on the road. 
at Miami will be a very difficult game. Virginia and Wake Forest will be games that are probably underdogs. Virginia Tech at home will be tough, uh, much like Pitt not playing up to their expectations, but on any given week can play like the team everyone thought they were going to be and beat you. They've got to win this week. Um, and then I think if they win this week, they should feel pretty good about getting into a bowl game. They should feel kind of okay about getting into a pretty good bowl game because, I mean, it's not like anybody else in the division or really outside of Clemson and NC State, the entire conference has pulled themselves away from the pack. I mean, if you look at the ACC standings, it's Clemson, North Carolina State, and like nine other teams all sort of smashed together in the middle. So, yeah, why not Pitt? It doesn't, there's no reason that that first four games has to define the rest of the season for them. I don't understand the fatalism that comes with thinking that it will. I just can't follow it. Maybe it will happen. I don't know. Um, you know, I can't predict the future. But there's, there's nothing to be taken from those games to suggest that it should. And I think that's the, that's the logical leap. And, you know, we ran a poll on the site uh, the other day, Pittsburgh Sports Now, earlier this week, about whether or not Pitt's going to win. Um, it's uh, three games that it needs to get bowl eligible. And I believe the majority said that they would. So, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just putting too much uh, to the voices of a loud, miserable few. Um, that's all I've got uh, as far as my thoughts. Let's pimp the coverage, as always. Get that out of there tonight. TJ at West Mifflin, big rivalry game. South Hills, Mon Valley, old-fashioned football. i got family from West Mifflin. I'm sure they're going. It's going to be fun. Parker Hurley there tonight, 7.30 kickoff. I'm at Heinz Field. Saturday, 3.30 for Pitt and Duke. And then back at Heinz Field, Sunday, 1 o'clock, Steelers, Browns. Big football weekend. Should be a lot of fun. Big playoff implications all throughout uh, Whippeal tonight. So take a look for the Whippeal scoreboard by Mike Vukovkan on the site tonight as well. Uh, that's always great, but it'll be especially important this week. Until next week, thanks for watching. Thank you to Beaver County Auto for sponsoring our beautiful studios. And I'll try to stay here for the rest of the season and not take any more weeks off. Uh, until next week, I'm Alan Saunders for Pittsburgh Sports Live. Thanks for watching.